Good evening. My name is Terry Tornick, and I'm the city council member from District 7. Uh, it's my happy job to uh, welcome you all on behalf of Mayor Bogard and the city council to this one city, one story event. This uh, Bible is open to Isaiah 816. I wonder if there should, if there's any consequence to that. Um, it's really a privilege to participate in this, the 11th version of our community reading program for several reasons. First, I think the event is fun. Um, we, we, not all of the city events and programs are, are as interesting or as, or as uh, uh, fun as this one is. Second, I think it reinforces the central role that our public library plays in our city. Uh, this is a role that is um, recognized by our citizens having approved a special tax not once but three times since 1993. That's not all very common, but it does, it does uh, add credence to the central role that our library plays in the life of this city. Finally and most important, this event and all the activities that are in your program that surround it, ranging from gardening to astronomy, uh, help to reinforce the community ties that maintain Pasadena as a great city. Uh, we usually define our city in terms of its, its uh, wonderful buildings, uh, uh, its institutions, the Rose Bowl and Caltech and Old Pasadena and the Arroyo and our wonderful urban forest, the kinds of things that people notice physically about Pasadena that set it apart. But really, it's the human interactions um, that I think really define our city, and it's activities like this that reintroduce people to their neighbors and to people they've never met before on an interpersonal level. So let me extend my thanks on behalf of the mayor and the city council, to Jan and the, and the library staff, to the, all the participants in this whole array of activities that have been happening and will be happening over the next uh, week, uh, to the selection committee that, that participated in choosing this wonderful book and author, and of course to our author, uh, Karen Thompson Walker for her wonderful book and her participation in this uh, event. And I would also like to thank her parents who were kind enough to join us tonight. So please enjoy your evening and continue to enjoy our city. And I'll now turn it over to Jan Sanders and the rest of your program. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Councilmember Tornick, and thanks to each of you for coming to spend an evening with us in conversation with our um, gifted author this, um, this year. Before we get too far into the program, I do want to take just a minute to recognize all those individuals who spend countless hours reading and discussing and rereading and arguing over and defending particular choices before we get to the final selection of our One City, One Story title. So if you're a member of that august body and you are with us tonight, would you please rise and let us thank you? I saw Brian Berry come in. <laughs> Jolly. Thank you so much. These people put in a lot of time and energy to make this happen, so we are, we are very grateful for them and for their support. And we're also grateful for the support of all of our sponsors. And one of our lead sponsors continues to be the members of the Friends of Pasadena Libraries. Uh, this is a very large group that does wonderful, wonderful things for, for the libraries in Pasadena. They have, a, they have a wide range of membership. And here to speak just a little bit about becoming a member of the Friends of the Pasadena Library is their chair of membership, John Price. Where's John? Oh, he sneaked up on me. Thank you. I'm sure you'll agree that if you have a really good friend, that's a wonderful thing. If you're a library in Pasadena, you now have a little over 500 good friends. As Jan said, we call them the friends of the Pasadena Public Library. We do a large number of funding for events and helping to fund events. We even stage a few events, and we uh, take care of bits and pieces of things that go on at Central Library and the 10 branches, the nine branches. 
Let me just give you a thumbnail of one of these things that we fund. If you're in a library in, uh, it's either October or November, at the right time, you're liable to see a group of very excited young children coming out of a, wherever they have the, uh, the children's story time. Each one of them will be carrying a little book. It's a fairly simple little paperback. But remember that in some cases, this is the first book that this child owns. If we follow that book home with this kid, we'll find that it gets read and read again until it's dog-eared and probably read aloud to a young, younger sister or brother. And pretty soon, that young reader is marching off to their library branch or central with their own library card and explaining to their brother or sister that when they can read, they can check out books too. Can you think of a better way to induce early reading among children? And the books are funded by the friends. How do we fund things? Well, we do it with our uh, monthly book sales. Second Saturday of every month at the patio at Central, 9 to noon. If it rains, we keep the books dry. You can get there and stay dry however you can. Uh, we fund it with uh, proceeds from our bookstore, which is in the, uh, the passageway that goes to the patio. And of course, best of all, we fund it with the membership donations from our members. Little members, little memberships, big memberships, lots of memberships. The more members we have, the more we can do for the libraries. And tonight when you leave, uh, there will be a member of our board at the exit to give you a copy of our latest newsletter which tells you things we've done recently. And if you are interested, you can also pick up a copy of our membership brochure which lists um, all of the things that we do. So the mission of the Friends is to support the library's programs, special services, and cultural events. Priority is given to projects that instill the excitement of discovery and love of reading in library patrons of all ages. We'd love to have you be a friend of the Pasadena Public Libraries. Thanks. Thank you, John, and thank you, members of the Friends, for all the volunteer time and energy you give to us. We, we certainly appreciate that. And now let's get down to the real event of the evening, a conversation with our author. After a lot of serious uh, conversation, the selection committee chose The Age of Miracles as our read for this year, our 11th year of the um, one City, One Story program. And as you know, one of the things that we try to do with that selection is to either choose someone who has a tie to Southern California or where the story has a tie to Southern California or it is of immediate and, and compelling interest to us as Southern Californians. Well, we sort of hit the Daily Double this year because not only did we choose a book whose, um, whose plot is set in Southern California, but we have chosen an author who is originally from San Diego. I know it's not Pasadena, but it's close. <laughs> it's close. Could have been San Francisco, that would be farther away. So, so we were delighted when we, when we began talking to Karen about coming to join us for, for this evening's events and, and the many events that happen today and tomorrow surrounding One City, One Story. Um, I think if you have not met her, you may be, as I was, surprised at how very young she is. Now, I realize that this white hair makes everybody look young to me. I get that. Um, but she is very young for an accomplished author. And as we were talking today, her book has not even been published for one year. Uh, it's, it's that new. Uh, we were comparing stories a little bit because <clears throat> in my travels, I've noticed that uh, the Age of Miracles has been featured in a number of airports. And Karen laughed and said, that's when you know you've made it, when you're in the airports. 
So, so I saw it in the Oakland airport, in the LAX, and um, in the Chicago airport as well. So you're familiar with the story. We're going to talk a little bit about her writing style and the story itself and a number of um, other concerns and themes that I have in mind. You will have time to ask questions yourself as the evening progresses. So if you have not had a chance to write down your question, I hope that you will do that. Someone from the library staff will collect them. But for now, please help me warmly welcome Karen Thompson Walker. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ta da! Which side do you want? Either side. What's your best side? <laughs> We're on TV. Pick your best side. Thank you. Thank you for coming. This I'm is glad great, to be here. isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it fun? <laughs> So, um, your book, I know, I know we've talked a little bit today with other members of, uh, of Pasadena about your book and sort of how it came to be. I think the first question that everybody wants to know is where you got this crazy idea. So tell us a little bit about that. It's a fascinating story. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I got the idea from something that, that really happened. Um, this was back in 2004. Um, the earthquake that caused the tsunami in Indonesia that year. I read that that earthquake was so powerful that it actually did affect the rotation of the Earth. Um, and so after that day, our 24-hour days were um, a fraction of a second shorter. And I remember kind of right where I was when I um, heard that detail because it just it sort of scared me, you know, to think that something I had thought of as kind of the definition of certainty, you know, every day the sun rises at a stable and predictable time. Um, I like to think so. Yeah. Uh, the idea that that was actually in flux was um, scary to me. And, and I started to wonder right away, you know, what would we do? How would we react? What would happen to the planet if a much, much larger shift were to take place in the rotation of the Earth? So that was the first kernel. Uh-huh. And then you researched? Yeah, and then, um, <clears throat> well, first I just, I wrote a short story um, about that premise that was only like 14 pages long. Um, and I did a little bit of research for that, and then I set it aside for a few years. And it was when I came back to it um, mm -hmm. a few years later that I thought, well, maybe this could be a novel. And then I started to do more research, yeah. So did, it, did the short story contain most of the elements that we find in the book? Was it the same cast of characters, that kind of thing? It was a similar cast of characters. It definitely had Julia, the main character, and the voice. Um, the voice of, of Julia, the adult Julia, looking back in very close detail on childhood. Um, and so it had this combination of, you know, uh, this voice that's looking back on a pivotal, pivotal time in her personal life, um, you know, sixth grade, um, and also, of course, a pivotal time in the sort of history of the Earth in this, in yeah. this world. Yeah, Let, let's talk about that a little bit. What, what made you choose her particular voice for this story? I mean, I would have thought, you know, maybe someone, I don't know, older and a little more jaded, um, <laughs> perhaps a scientific point of view, but an 11-year-old young girl who has all kinds of... of um, miracles she's trying to make happen on her own. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I didn't give it a lot of conscious thought right at the beginning, but I just knew right away, um, as soon as I, I, you know, I heard that news about the rotation of the earth, and I sat down and tried to write this, this short story, and the voice that came to me was an adult looking back on childhood. Um, and I think that was partly, I mean, it was partly a way of making sure that I could tell this big, big global story in a way that would feel hopefully per really personal and, uh -huh. and in that sense real, I hoped. And I thought if you focus on a young, a, on a young girl in a, and you know, sh her point of view is sort of narrow, but it's very close up on ordinary people, um, I thought that that would be right. interesting. Um, and, and the other thing is I think I, I love books that have, that have that perspective in general of an adult looking back on their childhood. And I think there's something about that narrative voice and that perspective that is always a little nostalgic. You know, it's always an, right. a, a person, a person talking about their childhood is always a person talking about this kind of lost era, you know, a lost time and place of, of childhood. Um, and so that voice felt right for a book in which, you know, Julie is looking back not only on the lost era of her childhood, but also the lost era of, you know, ordinary life on planet Earth. Yeah, and, and you know right away from the very first sentence that she's in the future looking back. Right. We didn't notice right away. We couldn't feel it. Right. That's a pretty, pretty captivating story for a beginning, I oh, think. Oh, thank you. 
Um, I, I was thinking through some, some other works. Of, I, I was taken by the way that you use very ordinary events and ordinary details to really build the story. Um, I, I remember at one point you made the comment, or someone made the comment, um, Julia's father was, they were sitting around having dinner, and Julia's father had his napkin across his lap and ate his pizza with a knife and fork. <laughs> and I thought, now that's a specific detail that not everyone would know. But, but I was kind of intrigued by your use of the ordinary. It brought to mind to me, and maybe this is a stretch, maybe you won't follow me on this, but uh -huh. we'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, it brought to mind uh, Thornton Wilder's play, Our Town. Oh, when, when Emily, You remember when Emily goes to heaven and then she asks to come back for one day and Mrs. Gibbs, her mother-in-law, says to her, don't do it, Emily, it's too painful, but if you must, choose a very unimportant day. Oh, yeah. Choose a day that doesn't really matter that much. Interesting. Did, did, you, did you think consciously about, about the juxtaposition between the ordinary and the very extraordinary? as you were writing this? You know, I think that one of the sort of exciting things about kind of coming across this premise, you know, writing about this huge um, sort of strange disaster. Um, Cosmic. Yeah. <laughs> it was suddenly, it was a way of writing about ordinary life that felt to me more um, visceral and exciting than it, than it would have before. So I was able to use, you know, just kind of sensory details from my, you know, fairly ordinary suburban California childhood. Um, but suddenly in this context, all those ordinary details ha seem to have more meaning because they, every ordinary life is, when, when you write about a story about in which ordinary life is under threat, um, all those ordinary details start to seem more precious and I think more interesting and more profound. At least that's the way I felt as I, as I wrote the book. Um, and I think, yeah, the, the further I got into the book, the more I realized that this was a story even though it has this extraordinary premise, it really is a story about ordinary life. And um, I wanted to render it as sort of vividly as possible. And I think, I think it, Julia is trying to render her memories of ordinary life um, as vividly as possible because some of those things have fallen away in the time that she's writing. Right, and, and the farther we go into the story, the more extraordinary things get layered on and on and on down to uh, at the very end when they have the um, what is it, metal, metal sheets encasing each of the homes to keep right. the radiation out Right, and right, right, yeah. right, because of the yeah. change in the magnetic field, more radiation right. is, is getting through. Right. So. Well, you indicated that now you're living in Iowa. That's right. <laughs> nice, nice state of Iowa. <laughs> um, but you grew up here in Southern California in San Diego. Mm -hmm. How much of the story is, how would the story have been different? Could you have written the story and put it in Iowa? Or did it sort of have to happen in Southern California? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, when I was writing the book, I was living in, in New York City. And um, so you were homesick. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think I was saying earlier to, to someone at the, earlier tonight um, that I think I, I realized that when I moved to New York, um, after spending my first you know, 23 years in California, I moved to New York to get an MFA. Um, and it was in New York that I, I started to that was when I was started to be able to see what was interesting and what was different about California. Like mm. suddenly all the details, you know, mm. like the eucalyptus trees or the way that the ocean smells or, um, you know, just all those kind of ordinary details. It, it was suddenly easier for me to see those details. Um, you needed that distance? Yeah, think? I think so. And cause, because then I was, I was thinking about California and, and, and I could tell suddenly what made it unique because now I had this perspective of living in a different place. Um, so I think that, okay, I see that. Yeah. that was part of why I said it in California. And certainly, you know, it's the story of a young girl. She's 11 years old. Um, and it, was, it, was, it made sense for me to set the book in the place where I was 11, because there's so many details from childhood that are so specific that um, it would be much harder to imagine what it would be like for, um, to be a child in New York City, because I haven't been a child in New York City. So um, it, at first, it was just convenient. But I think there's also something something about um, a Californian's sense of natural disaster that I think also... Um, what does that mean, California's sense of national disaster? Oh, <laughs> I just mean... You walked into that one. What does that mean? I think for me, growing up in ca California, and it's not the only place on the planet, but certainly growing up in California, is a, you have a, 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 
a strong sense of the power of natural disaster from an early age. And you know that even if it doesn't happen to you, you know that an earthquake could strike and change your life in an instant, you know? And growing up, I remember, you know, um, doing earthquake drills at school or, of course. Um, you know, I think I told this story at, at a school earlier today, but um, about how one, once, I think it was 92, there was two earthquakes in the same day, and something about that combination led some experts to say that there was an increased chance of the big one striking, you know, later that same day or the next 24 hours. And I just remember that day really vividly, and it, 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 it sort of scared me, but it also means that um, it just gave me this sense, I think from a young age, of what it feels like to, to know that those disasters are possible. But at the same time, maybe even more interestingly, it gave me a sense of how, how much you adapt to that and how much you don't, how most of the time in California we don't think about, you know, earthquakes That's or true. brush fires. That's and true. Um, I think that helped me imagine, you know, in my book, this, um, such, these, these characters who are on the one hand living with this very frightening and sudden and, and huge sort of radical uncertainty, but at the same time, uh, to some extent, they're able to adapt and carry on with ordinary life. And I think there was something about growing up in California that showed me uh, how good human beings are at that uh, skill. <laughs> Maybe we're more resilient. Maybe you're more resilient for Maybe. Having, having grown up here. <laughs> you're right, with the threat of, oh, this could be the big one. Yeah, that, time the combination around. of knowing. I grew up in the Midwest. It was always a tornado, yeah. but not quite so dramatic. Right. Well, everywhere has their... Well, not everywhere. Most places Most have a, places. <laughs> most places. Have a natural disaster. <laughs> well, and also, um, you know, the, the, the role of the ocean and the tides and, you know, the beaching of the whales and all that. Huh. Yeah. You, you sort of played into that as well. Yeah, I mean, I just tried to use the, the environment that I remember so vividly mm -hmm. from childhood, um, and the beach was certainly one of those, those things. Um, and imagining that there's something so frightening about the changes in the ocean, um, and so, um, you know, I put that, the, the whales begin to beach themselves, and the tides change, so the, the, the waterfront mansions get flooded, and I was certainly picturing uh, the mansions that are, you know, in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, or, or Malibu. Malibu. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Malibu. Yeah. Um, I noticed that throughout the book there seems to be sort of a recurrent theme of um, of almost renewals or returns or whatever. You, you have a, a, a number of of characters who sort of uh, leave and then come back. Um, I, I wonder if, before we get too deeply into that, I'm wondering about the story um, of who was it? Julia's grandfather's brother. Oh. That was lost, and then he turned up in Sweden yeah, or whatever it was. In Nor Norway. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. okay, Norway. <laughs> Norway. Tell, tell us a little bit about where, where that came from. Is, oh. Was there, a, was there a, um, a particularly salient point that you wanted to make? Yeah, it's interesting that you know, I, no one has pointed that out to me before. The, really? The returns, but you're right, there's it, a lot there's of them. There's a lot of returns. Yeah. A lot of returns. Um, it's so interesting when you publish a book because then people will give you these readings of your book that are so true and accurate, and yet I didn't even know <laughs> that I'd done that. <laughs> so um, you're right, there are a lot. Um, so that particular story, it's um, uh, Julia's grandfather's uncle um, uh, disappeared uh, in Alaska, but then 20 years later, her grandfather, um, she, he, he tells a story about how he, you know, thinks he saw him on a bus in Norway. Um, and, and that is a story, that, that's a family story um, that, that comes from, uh, the, the grandfather character is somewhat based on my real grandfather, and he used to tell a story that, it's not exactly that, but very similar, that he, he did have an uncle who disappeared um, in a boat in Alaska, but he was always, my grandfather was always convinced that, um, that, that something that it wasn't that he didn't really disappear. It's, he didn't, wasn't really he was lost at sea, but he, he he really did. He oh, my, really? My, well, my grandfather really did believe that he saw him in Norway once. Um, and the thing I remember my grandfather saying uh, was that he saw him on the bus. He he was on a bus, and then he noticed that his uncle, who he hadn't seen in I don't know ten years maybe. I, I, um, he, he he was sure that he was on the bus with him, and then when his uncle. Uh, saw him, he got off the bus and just, as I remember the story, he just, just walked into the woods. And at that point in the story, my grandfather, which I think I put in the book, he would say, that would be just like him. That would be just like him. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I always thought, like, what kind of person was this uncle that, he, that that's what he would do? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that story, it was kind of a great family story, so I put it in the book. <laughs> well, well, it's interesting. And then, and then, of course, you have the 
you have the departure of Hannah, and then she returns yeah. a very different, a very different person. Mm -hmm. um, wh what's the uh, talk to us a little bit about Hannah as a character? So Hannah is Julia's, um, you know, sort of best friend. best friend. Yeah, at the start of the book, she's her best friend, um, but. Uh, so her family is Mormon, and you know, at the very beginning, when when um, this news comes out, you know, people are afraid it's going to be the end of the world, and um, different people react in different ways. And I think, especially religious people, have different uh, religious ideas about what this, the meaning of this is. And so, um, Hannah's family, partly for religious reasons, and also just to be near her family, Hannah's family packs up and leaves California and goes to to be with their family in Utah. Right. Um, and so that leaves Julia sort of suddenly exposed and lonely um, without her friend there. Um, and, and, and that, that was just, and then when she returns, they've sort of, they, they can't connect again and she's made a new good friend. And I think that, that sort of rung true for me as my, my memories of middle school. I mean, but, it's a very <laughs> typical female middle school kind of thing to go on. I mean, the sud not so much the leaving for Utah, but the, sudden rupture of close friendships, you know, suddenly right. Um, right. everything can change. Um, so that was partly just something that I remembered from middle school and seemed true, but it was also a way of, um, you know, in Julia's case, she's sort of haunted by this question of how much, how many things that happen in her life, like that, the loss of that friendship, are the result of the slowing, this mm -hmm. huge catastrophe, and how much of it is just ordinary life? And it's kind of an unknowable question. So in the case of Hannah, would they have you know, had a falling out or grown apart anyway, or is it because of this catastrophe? Hard to say. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to say. And I, I thought it was, um, I, I like the way you sort of brought in a little bit of religious fervor, but didn't let you go too, let yourself go too far down that road. There's a little bit about, you know, how the Mormons would have reacted. There were one or two, as I'm remembering it, there were one or two sidewalk preachers that made, yeah. some, well, of course, the gentleman who got hit by the, <clears throat> that her mother hit was... But, but you didn't really get into that a lot. I thought that was um, kind of interesting, too. Yeah, it seemed, um, it just seemed true to me that, um, yeah, that at, at a time where people are afraid they're facing, you know, the end of the world or at least the end of human life as we know it, it seemed like a time where religion would be especially important to people. Um, but it was kind of, kind of interesting to try to imagine how different religions would respond. You know? Yeah, yeah. Why Age of Miracles? The title. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I get, that's a question that I always get. Um, you know, I chose the title early when I only had about 40 pages of it written. Um, and I heard it in a song, it's a Billie Holiday song, um, or at least the version that I know, she sings it. Um, and I just, I liked the phrase right away, and I felt like it might fit for my book because it has a couple of sort of double meanings. You know, it's, it, my book is really, you know, equally sort of the story of of global catastrophe, but also the story of, about growing up. And so um, I liked the idea that the word age could have this double meaning, you know, Julia's age, she's 11, uh, a time in life, but also age as in an era in the history mm -hmm. of the planet. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then yeah. miracles, I certainly meant in kind of a looser than usual way, you know, it's um, not in the religious way and, and not even exactly in the positive way, but I, I thought of a miracle as, um, an event that happens that breaks with our rules, the rules of reality as we understand them. Um, and so I think certainly the sudden slowing of the rotation of the earth in a way that no one expects or understands is sort of uh, miraculous in the sense of it, it's extraordinary and awe-inspiring and True. seemingly impossible. True. Um, and then in a, in a different way, I feel like adolescence uh, or middle school is, a, is, is in the book I called it the age, is the age of miracles because it's a time when things are changing so quickly that it seems almost impossible. You know, friendships are forming very quickly and they can fall apart very quickly. You know, first love, kids are just growing at um, sort of seemingly impossible speeds and I think there's something sort of miraculous about that. It is. <laughs> and then at one point later in the book, someone's trying to create miracle rice yeah, there's a line in there about oh, miracle rice. Oh, right. right. Yeah, Wasn't yeah. Was it rice? It was r rice. Yeah, yeah that could so. grow. Um, they, they could. They're trying to develop rice that could that could grow without light, which could be important as these, you know, as the as the rotation of the earth slows down, the days get very long and the nights get very long. So, in right. case they need um, to be able to grow rice, you know, in the dark. That's the idea. So, I want to look a little bit at at um, the pacing of the book, uh, because I found the pacing really kind of 
um, intriguing and very interesting. You have the natural pace of, of, of the, the story itself, because you're talking about day and night, and that has its own, or mm -hmm. until then, had its <laughs> own ebb and flow and a, and a sort of um, natural way of things to progress. And then there's that conversation between the real timers and the, um, what are they, clock, clock people? Clock timers. And yeah. the clock mm -hmm. timers uh, about, about how pace in their life is altered based mm -hmm. on their interpretation. Uh, talk to us a little bit about, about how you came to that pacing. It seems to me like that would be a very difficult um, sort of um, um, element to put into a book. How do you know when you have the pacing right? Oh, yeah. Well, I think that's one of the hardest things, for sure. Um, but it's also, for me, one of the most um, important things to me. You know, my, my favorite thing is a book, when I come across a book that is, you know, not only well-written, but also has a really gripping story. That Those are my favorite books. Um, and so it's something that I try to think a lot about. Um, but it is hard. Um, I mean, the only thing that I, that I, that I try to do that's the main, my main way of telling if the pacing is right is just to try as hard as, as, mu as much as I can to imagine the reader, you know, which is a big act of the imagination to pretend that this is not my book and instead I, I'm, I'm reading, you know, say someone else's work, but to try to put myself in the reader's position and have a sense from that, you know, how long is too long for a scene, you know, how fast do I need to move the story. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I mean, that was, I tried to pace it in the way that, that I as a reader would appreciate, you know, at a, at a fast enough level, um, but still hopefully with time for characters to develop and there to be sort of um, time to kind of, yeah, develop the different themes. Um, but that is one of the trickiest things. Um, it's so interesting, though, that you connected it with um, the pace of life, how the pace of life changes for the, um, for the real timers especially. You know, the, 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 what happens is uh, once the slowing starts, the 24-hour day, as you know, no longer corresponds to our clocks. So some people, most people, choose to stay on the clocks anyway. Um, as the government sort of suggests or demands. Uh, but the real timers refuse to do that because they're, you become completely out of sync with day and night. Um, so the real timers are, are living by the rising and setting of the sun, even though that, those days are getting longer and longer. Um, and it was really kind of fascinating to imagine how your life might change, you know? I would think so. Yeah, because especially, you know, we're so used to the 24-hour clock, and also I think many of us feel like there's not enough time in the day. So to imagine these kind of longer, slower days was, was interesting. Well, right, plus you have the, um, the sense of time that an 11-year-old girl would have yeah. is very different, maybe, than the sense of time you have as an adult or, yeah, or you're a, right, you know, a very sure. busy uh, industrialist or something like that, you know, you just look at it differently. It, it's true, and I think... I mean, you, you know, you remember how long days are when you're a child. Yeah. They're not 72 hours, but sometimes they feel like they're right. 72 hours. Right. Yeah, and how, as, as children, and I think this happens in the book, um, you know, you, you can become friend, good friends with someone very quickly, and as, as if you've had more time together than you really have, you know? Right, um, right. It's interesting. So tell us a little bit about the, um, about the science of the thing. Uh, are, you, are you a natural science buff? Were you in, um, you know, physics club when you were in high school and that kind of thing? <laughs> I was not in physics oh. club. <laughs> That's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I was never, um, I, 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 never st I never studied science. That was never my sort of strength. I mean, I was always more on, on the writing and language and book side. Um, but I always have loved to read about science as kind of a lay person, you know? The, the science section of the newspaper is my favorite section, and I love to read about, you know, um, when scientists think they've discovered a new planet or a new asteroid, you know, I'm always really interested in those stories or, um, or a new species that we didn't know that lives at the bottom of the ocean or, or something like that, you know? I'm always really fascinated by all those stories, and I think it's because I just love how science is, is about um, just trying to map our world, you know, try to just, we're always getting through science, getting a, a better and better understanding of what the world, right. um, what there is in the world and in the universe. Um, so I've always been drawn to that, but not, it, it was never my strength. <clears throat> so I, like I said, this book grew out of hearing this fascinating detail, scientific detail about the rotation of the earth. Um, and then after that, I, I tried to do research. I mean, I did do research as I wrote the story, but I tried to kind of 
I didn't want to load it down with scientific research, but it was very important to me that it feel real, you know, because I felt like if, 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 you're, if, if the reader doesn't believe the situation, you know, if the science doesn't seem real to the reader, then you won't be concerned about the people, and that was my primary concern, was to make sure that you felt like these are real people going through a real um, crisis. Um, and, it, and it could have been plausible, even yeah. though it's fiction. Right, right. Could have um, been. Who's to say? Yeah, I mean, so I, I did a lot of, I did all kinds of research, and some of it was accidental, you know, like, if I was, um, if I just came across a story about circadian rhythm, human circadian rhythms, and how our sleep patterns work, or, um, you know, mysterious extinction of a species, or extreme weather, all those things, if there was anything I could learn from mm -hmm. that story in our real world mm -hmm. that applied to my, my book, I would, you know, sort of add that detail and drop it in. Um, did, so. did you ever feel sort of overwhelmed by some <coughs> of the research? Because it seems like, I mean, I'm, I'm a liberal arts person myself, and if I were to sort of turn one day and say, okay, I'm going to learn about astrophysics so I can write this book, I think I would you know, claw my eyes out, but how, how do you sort of get past that initial fear that we liberal scientists have yeah. about, about that? Yeah, it was hard. I mean, um, I mean, one of the hardest things was, I, I, at one point I came across the, f uh, the fact that uh, the rotation of the Earth is involved in um, the generation of the magnetic field, which protects us from radiation from space, uh, and, and some of the sun's radiation. So that was a detail that uh, I came across somewhere, and then I ha and then I just I am just imagine tried to imagine through the research what would happen uh, to the magnetic field if the rotation of the Earth slowed down. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when I get excited as a fiction writer is when I come across a detail. I'll come across something in science where the scientists say we still don't totally understand, you know, uh -huh. X, Y, Z, because then that helps me feel like I have a little bit of space for the imagination. Right, um, right. Get so, your toe in the door on that one. Yeah, so, so, um, so the magnetic field is one of those things that uh, scientists say they, they, they don't fully understand that process of how they know it's related, the, the, the turning of the Earth is related mm -hmm. to the magnetic field, but it's, there's still some murkiness about exactly what the... Um, what the connection is, and anyway, there's, there's, there's it, to me, a space, I mean, there's a space for scientists and a space for fiction writers, because scientists, I'm sure, are working on trying to solve that puzzle and figure it out, but for me, it gave me a certain license, which um, I think for me, for this book, it was, in general, it was important um, to write about a situation that uh, no one expects to happen, and so no one knows for certain exactly everything that would happen. Um, sure. Certainly, astrophysicists, one of whom I, sh I showed the book to, have a, you know, they can, they can have an idea of what would happen, and um, so after I sold my book, I finally worked up the nerve to, to have an astrophysicist read it, um, which was scary, <laughs> and uh, the reason I didn't have, I him, have someone read it earlier was um, just because I felt this, this feeling like I knew how hard it was to publish a book, and I just had no idea if this book would ever get published, and I didn't want to, you know, waste well, a scientist's put yourself out time. There, yeah, it's and not use work, his time, yeah. right? So, use his or her time. So, um, so anyway, I showed it to an astrophysicist, and he was really great. And mostly, I was relieved by how much of he felt was how much of it he felt was plausible. And then he helped me fix a few things that I had misunderstood. And then, of course, you know, as a fiction writer, I was happy to take a few liberties. So, <laughs> seems fair to me. <laughs> I mean, why would you write fiction? <laughs> um, so, so I understand that, and, and, and you come away from those kinds of research periods with sort of finite information, definitions that you can work with, or that you know that you can adjust a little bit to have your own point of view. What about the psychological? How, how did you get to the sickness, the syndrome? Right, right. Well, I mean, some of the psychological things... Um, I did a little bit of research about that, like how sleep deprivation might affect people, um, you know, but a lot of that is, you know, just as a human being, in a way, I've been doing research for my whole life, you know, on, <laughs> on you know, what it's like to just to, to be a person and to be, um, have relationships with other people and watching how other people react in all the various ways that humans uh, react to crises. Right. Um, so, so, I mean, those kinds of things, just as a writer, every time you sit down to write anything, even when, the, even when it is just straight realism and doesn't have this big um, extraordinary crisis, um, you're always imagining, trying to imagine and give life to, and make, make the people seem real and make the psychology seem real. So it was... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious to know if you, if you did any 
if you unearthed anything that talked about what the effect of something like that might might look like or be, you know, sort of. Well, I did do um, I did some research on about people who live in uh, above the Arctic Circle because oh, um, in, the, in the darkness. Yeah, yeah, because you know, in the book, as the the nights get very long and the days get very long, um, and the closest thing I could imagine or I knew of in our real world um, to that type of life was. Um, you know, people who really do live above the Arctic Circle, so that in the winter right. they have you know darkness all the, for 24 hours and or or, or longer, um, and then in the summer they have light all the time. So I did a little bit of research about that, and I read um, a study that said that um, suicide rates are slightly higher in um, above the Arctic Circle, and mm -hmm. especially in the summer. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting because um, you'd think maybe, or I would think maybe, and this is a detail I put in the book, I would think that long periods of darkness would be harder psych on the so psyche, too. but um, there was something about, it, it, was, it, it was, there was an increased, uh, I think some increased depression, but for sure increased impulsiveness for some reason um, hmm. in, when, in, when in those long periods of daylight. Um, and so that was a detail that I, that I read in the newspaper and, and then put into my book. And that was important to her father. Because he, he sort of bowed to his impulses. Yeah, he, that's true. He does become more impulsive, yeah. It's yeah. mm -hmm. a little bit off, perhaps, his normal behavior. Yeah, but th that was a detail of that um, that I got from this one study that said they found more impulsiveness mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in times of, of um, prolonged daylight. And so I imagined my characters, <clears throat> during pro the prolonged daylight that they face, I imagined that maybe they would be more impulsive, too. Uh, makes sense. So. <laughs> So how you're you're very young. How how many how much of your life is bound up in this book? How long did it take you? Oh, um, well, I started the short story um, when I was in graduate school in two thousand and four or five, uh, right after that piece of news I read, um, and it was just kind of an experiment. And I set it aside for a few years, mm -hmm. and then I started working in book publishing. And I, then I came back to that story and decided to try to turn it into a novel. Um, and so from that point. Um, when I started trying to turn it into a novel to when I um, finished it was about four years. So. And you, you wrote on it every day? I, I read something that you wrote on the subway. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, it's I kind had, of interesting. I had a full-time job as a book editor in New York, and um, it was a great job, but it was, I mean, I started as an editorial assistant, kind of worked my way up, but uh, you don't have very much free time because you're, you spend all day, you know, answering phones and having meetings and writing jacket copy and stuff, but then you're expected at night and on the weekends to be reading manuscripts, other people's manuscripts, you know, and <clears throat> deciding which ones to publish and also, you know, editing the ones that you already know you are going to publish. So I had hardly any um, free time during that time. So the only time that I could find really was before I went to work in the morning. So, um, so it's, and it wasn't very much time. It was about an hour every day. Um, or sometimes half an hour. Um, so it really was a book that I wrote, yeah, minute by minute. Um, and sometimes I would bring it, my laptop on the subway, and that was for two reasons. One, sometimes it was if I'd had a really great writing morning and I wished I could keep writing instead of leaving for work, but I had to leave. So I brought my laptop to try to finish my thoughts. Mm -hmm. But other times it might be because I slept in, you know, I slept in plenty of days. I was, <laughs> uh, but then I would be kind of annoyed at myself and I would think, well, I'll just bring my laptop and at least I'll write for 20 minutes on the train. Right. Um, because right. it was, it, it really bothered me if I, if a, if a day went by when I didn't do any work on it, that made me feel like I was never going to finish the book. So as long as I wrote for, you know, 20 minutes or an hour a day, it felt like slowly but surely I'll eventually finish it. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up. I mean, the whole thing is about time, and even in the writing of it, you were very aware of time and making sure that you assigned the time and all that. It's true, yeah. It's kind yeah. of crazy. I know. Sometimes I think about, was there some kind of something psychologically going on that in a time when I had, I felt like I didn't have enough hours in the day, that then I invented this story in which the days actually literally <laughs> grew. I don't know. Well, that seems <laughs> fair. That seems, that seems like one approach, at least. <laughs> What do you think was the hardest part of telling us this story? Hmm. Was there a point where you just really got stuck and you said, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know where to go, I don't know what to do. I have to cogitate on this a little while. Um, well, the ending was very hard to figure out. It was hard to decide sort of where to leave the story. Um, so yeah, that was probably one of the hardest things. And I had set up a, a, 
a sort of a challenge for myself, which I didn't realize, uh, because at the very beginning, you know, the first time I wrote the short story, the first page I wrote, I, I had this voice that was an adult looking back on childhood. And I wanted that, I also wanted that voice because I wanted to be able to have access to an adult's, um, you know, thinking and, mm -hmm. and perspective, mm -hmm. even though I was writing about childhood. But that gap between when the action of the story happens where she's a child and the time it's taken for her to grow up and be able to tell this story, it opened up this kind of... Um, just technical challenge for me because I was imagining the book as like this one year in her life, but then of course you want to know what happened all, in all the time since. Of course. So that was it was a hard uh, thing to, to figure out how to how to manage that. <laughs> did you did you decide to make her father an obstetrician as a sense of irony? Oh, <laughs> I mean you know sort of a birth rebirth <clears throat> kind of thing. Um, or did you just pull it out of the air? I mean, I, 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 I pictured him to be a sort of a solid person who, and I like to him, him being a doctor. Um, I don't know why I chose for him to be an obstetrician. Um, I mean, there's something, I think there's something so primal about that, even though mm -hmm. it's a, um, you know, it's a, a, just a profession. It's one of the professions we have. It's a job. But then again, it is like what's more sort of fundamental than that, um, you know, the, the beginnings of human lives are happening every day at this person's job. Um, so there was something appealing about including that, even just as a small detail in the book. Well, and there's, I mean, you, you could go back there and look at cycles and returns and timing as well. You're I mean, right, it's, yeah. it's a nine-month job, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, and you're, you're seldom on the clock, you know, it just sort of, sort of happens as well. Right, right. I think, yeah. So. And I mean, you're, I think you're right also that, you know, writing a book about where um, human life is sort of under threat, you know, they don't know what's going to happen, then um, I think the Julia's youth is, is sort of extra poignant in that world, but also the idea of babies being born is also, they're being born in, what kind of world are they being born into? There's sort of something interesting about that, I thought. Yeah, yeah there, that's right. Well, there are all kinds of themes that we have not explored. There are all kinds of ideas that are in the story. Um, that are really intriguing and very thoughtful. I was um, really taken by the number of ideas and questions that came up in, in really a pretty short novel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty short novel. So, mm -hmm. so that was interesting. But I want to leave a lot of space for other people to have questions. I don't want to ask you all the questions. Okay. <laughs> I want people to have an opportunity to voice their own questions and, and uh, come to Karen with whatever... Um, points you would like to make. Do we have some questions from the audience? <laughs> Coming right up. And thank you so much for being here. I'm just so glad, and thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, we're delighted. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Okay. Uh, here's a very basic question. Okay. Just how did Julia get to be 23 years old? <laughs> it seems that everything was dying, food, etc., and that humans would die too. How did she survive? <laughs> um, well, I think the focus of the book, like I said, I, I, I like this idea that she's sitting down to write, you know, the story of sort of the first year that this news was coming out. Um, and so the book doesn't go into a lot of detail about what has happened since, but I guess I imagined that... Um, even though life has gotten much harder and um, there's been a lot of damage to the planet, um, you know, s humans are very adaptable and resilient and that they would, you know, until human life is literally impossible, they would, you know, a certain number of people would, would remain. Um, so in my mind, it was, was that it hadn't quite, things are dire, but they don't, they're, people are still managing to survive, but they just don't know what lies ahead. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'm interested in this one. Um, this individual says, in, in one group I was in, someone read a review saying that this should have been a YA book, a young adult book. And this individual disagreed. Did, did you think of it as a YA title? If so, why or not? You know, I, I, I thought of it as an adult um, book, and it was published as an adult book. Um, and, and, and most of my expertise is in adult books. You know, I, the, the books that I read have mostly been adult books, um, and I love, I love stories that are adults, I think I already mentioned this, but adults looking back on childhood because then it's about 
inherently it's about being a child and being an adult, you know, at the same time. And, and every adult has been a child. So, um, so I was imagining adult readers, but I, it's been really kind of exciting um, to find that younger readers are responding to it. And it makes sense because, you know, it's so much, it is so much about adolescence. Um, and then I guess the other thing is it's interesting. I mean, I've, I've learned more about the YA genre since I published this book. Um, and I think it's, it's so interesting because I, it's hard to exactly decide what it even means because I think... Oh, I'm with you. <laughs> I know. I think originally it meant literally a book that is only meant for, you know, teenagers or younger <clears throat> or kids. Um, but now I think it means something different because there's so many, it, it does mean that, but there's so many adults who love to read YA and they say, you know, like, I love to read YA, like YA is my favorite genre. And so then they're not, they're not younger readers. So it's just kind of fascinating to me to figure out, is it just any book that has to do with childhood or anyway? Could be, so, could be. But I'm Could open. be for young adults or about young adults yeah. or whatever. So, um... I really, I should probably read more, more um, YA books, but... <laughs> have you had a lot of reaction from young adults? I have, yeah, yeah. And, um, and how have they greeted the book? Did they, did they find that it was motivational to them? Did they find it, that they were despairing when they read it? Or were they just questioning? Or? You know, I found that the adults find it much more... Um, much sadder, more melancholy than the kids. I think kids... Um, I mean, in a way, that's how Julia is, too. Like there, maybe you just don't have as much perspective when you're so young, you can't, maybe. it's just, I don't know what it is, but they, they're wrapped up in the story and they're interested and um, they, they find it less, yeah, they're not as sad, saddened by it. <laughs> here's, here's a question you must have known that you would get when you came back to Southern California. Oh. Um, it's actually, uh, I'm gonna wrap two here, mm -hmm. questions together. Is there a plan for the movie? <laughs> You knew you'd get that here, right? And, and when can we expect to see your next work? Oh, um, well, I, I did uh, option the movie rights to a company called River Road, which I was very excited about. Um, and they did um, Brokeback Mountain and The Tree of Life and a couple of other um, sort of, you know, artistic movies. So uh, they're, they, they're working on it. They have a script and they're looking for um, a director and so, I'm hoping that it happens. I mean, I know that um, Hollywood is such a, a crazy place and a lot of times a book gets options or the movie rights uh, are sold and then it never gets made into a movie or it takes 15 years, you know, so who knows. But, but they're working on it and it seems to be moving in the right direction, so crossing my fingers. <laughs> I, I think it would be exciting to, it to exciting. see it as a movie, yeah. <laughs> so what about the second book? Oh, uh, and I am working on a new book. Um, I'm still in the relatively early stages, um, and I feel a little like superstitious about um, saying too much about it, but uh, I guess what I've been saying is that it is like The Age of Miracles. It's another story about um, you know, ordinary people facing a, a really extreme situation, but just a different, different kind of situation. We'll just wait and, <laughs> and, and see it when it comes out. <laughs> uh, one, of our, one of our participants is interested in, um, in, in your career as an editor, your, your book career and mm -hmm. how that might have influenced your writing, if you think it did. Yeah, you know, I think it definitely influenced me. Um, I know that it made me a better uh, writer, and I think that's, that's because it made Just me... Just because you had to read so carefully? Yeah, or what? because it made me a better reader, um, and so I, part of learning to be an editor was learning to figure out, um, and I had some really great, you know, mentors, you know, mm -hmm. my bosses were, um, especially the first one I worked with, he was a very... A uh, good editor and very thorough, and um, so so during the, during the time I worked with him, and as I became just became an editor, I was I was learning um, to figure out on a really close level, you know, what makes for a really a clear sentence, what's a confusing sentence, what um, uh, what what's the right pacing, you know, mm -hmm. for a for a chapter or for a whole novel, or you know, what what's something that, what's the kind of thing that are, that that a reader starts to feel like is too slow or confusing, or uh, what makes for a believable character. Like, all of those things were things I had to learn as an editor um, and had to try to help authors if, if, as, when I detected, you know, something was wrong. Um, I had to sort of help them figure out how to fix it. And so all those lessons I was learning at work, I definitely took home and applied to my own writing. And I tried to imagine when I was writing this book that I was also editing it. You know, I would try to look at it with my editor's eyes. And, of course, that's an act of the imagination. You know, you can never... <laughs> 
it can never be quite the same, but I, I think um, it definitely helped me, for sure, made me a better writer. It would make it much more difficult, it seems to me, because you're, you're, you're really sort of writing and judging and rejudging and rewriting and... Yeah, you know, a lot of writers find that to be a paralyzing process, you know, the, the, um, the revising and, and, mm -hmm. and being criti you know, critical of your own work. It can be harmful to a lot of writers, especially, especially at, while they're trying to be creative and write. But for me, it's a very enjoyable process. You know, it's like, um, like polishing something, you know, just making it as perfect as possible. Is that's, I enjoy it, so I like to edit as, as I write my sentences. <laughs> then it takes a very long time to get something written. It's doesn't? true. It does. It makes me a slow writer, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, just two more questions. Um, talk to us a little bit about the books that have inspired you. What kind of books really uh, light up your face? Uh -huh. um, well, my favorite books are books that, um, where there's something really interesting going on with the writing, you know, where the, the writing is very beautiful or very stylish and, you know, attention has been paid to the kind of language that the, the writer is using. Um, but so so they have that element, but also some kind of gripping story. You know, I find those are my favorite when those two things come together. So um, some of my favorites are uh, Blindness by Jose Saramago, which is about a city that has this mysterious epidemic of blindness. Um, the Road by Cormac McCarthy. Um, it's probably more more that you probably might be more familiar with. Um, the Virgin Suicides by Jeffrey mm -hmm. Eugenides, which mm -hmm. I. I loved, and I love how he writes about youth in this really, in ordinary suburban life in this really beautiful way. Um, and that one, that one definitely helped inspire me to write my book because it was like he found this way to talk about ordinary suburban childhood, but because it has these dramatic deaths, um, those, thing, those ordinary things are thrown into relief and become, I think, more meaningful, um, or, or it makes you realize the meaning. So those are, those are some of my favorites. Um, Marilyn Robinson is another uh -huh. one of my favorites. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she's good. Okay, one, one last um, piece of advice that our audience is asking for. Mm -hmm. Your advice for aspiring novelists trying to make it in a declining, so slowly revolving public climate. In other words, I think they're talking about the fact that, you know, publishing itself has changed so much. So yeah. what's, what's the advice for the next group? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Uh, it, definitely the knowledge that it is, that it's going to be a hard road is probably one of the most valuable things um, to have. And that, that's one thing that I did have, you know. The, when I first started working in book publishing, it was kind of discouraging to see all these novels come across people's desks that I, you, can, you know that someone spent, you know, years on mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. someone might, an editor might read it and think like, oh, this person, this person is a really good writer, but this book just doesn't work. And then that's it. And it's done. It was years of that person's life. And they had some talent, you know. So That's heartbreaking. Yeah. It was, so it was hard. But um, I think I, I sort of, once I got over that, then I, I had a thicker skin about that. And I also had really low expectations, which is sort of <laughs> sad, I guess. But it makes it so that I was, you know, kind of convinced I would not publish this book. And I was just like, well, maybe if I could just publish it somewhere, if just one editor takes a chance on it, um, I'll be happy. So anyway, so that, that, that was good. I mean, I think, I think the most useful advice I ever got, which I try to repeat, is to just try to think of your writing career um, as separate from your publishing career. Because you know, you have better control over your writing, you know, like just getting up every day and, and working on the writing and making it, making the writing as, as, as good as it can be, uh, making the book as good as it can be before you try to publish it. Um, and just to try to get the, get sort of daily pleasure, if you can, out of the writing itself. Mm -hmm. um, because there could be, in, in ways that are good and bad, the publishing world is just crazy. I mean, like, you know, they, they can, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of disappointments, and it's, it's right. nice if you can keep them, them separate, I think. But you're one of a long string of authors who have said the best way to write is just to continue to write. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Just write and write yeah. and write. I think and that's a, another uh, good piece of advice I got was when I was in college. It was from um, the writer Amy Bender. She um, was a, a teacher of mine at UCLA and, and, and was great. And she had this idea. She encouraged us to submit uh, our short stories to journals right away, like even though we were young and, and I mean... I, I think about it now, I wonder if she sort of knew we weren't ready, like we weren't going to publish these <laughs> stories. I mean, I don't know if she thought that or not, but I feel like we were years away from publishing the stories, but she had this, this, um, this 
sort of advice that like, you don't have to be in charge of when that's gonna happen. Like you just keep writing and keep getting better and you're gonna keep, you send your stories out and then one day, and that was her experience, like after years, a few in sort of quick succession for her started to get accepted places. And I think, I think that's true too. You just, the more you write, the better you get at it. And then someday if you just keep at it, you know, you'll have the, be the better your own, the better the book is, the better the chance that someone will publish it, but it makes, it, there might be a lot of no's before. That makes wonderful, pragmatic sense. <laughs> a very, a very um, good approach, I think, for any of us. <laughs> well, um, thank you for being here. Thank you so much thank for having me. Thank you for sharing really your honored. evening with us. This has mm -hmm. been great fun. So let's, let's thank, um, let's thank Karen again. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>